Seasteading is a term and concept we non Learjet owning plebeians don't get to hear a lot about, if at all. It is promoted by its billionaire backers as an altruistic project to counter population growth, a cheaper and way less controversial than, say, mass tube tying entire third world nations. Seasteaders want to utilise all that wasted salt water on the planet we know now as oceans. The rich and fearful are not content with just bunker networks in, say, Queenstown, New Zealand, or for that matter, rural North Dakota. They picture futuristic floating cities to land their helicopters and moor their super yachts, strategically placed just far away from the coast of a sovereign nation, and they can't do a damn thing. In short, it's a tax dodge for rich folk who don't like being encumbered with duty-free limits. A good example of what are called aquapreneurs is one of New Zealand's newest checkbook citizens, venture capitalist Peter Thiel, with a net worth of 2 billion US. He has the income to make his dream of owning a desert island on stilts a reality. My lesser dream is just somewhere with better weather than Christchurch. Talking and conceptualising are one thing, and getting your servants' feet wet and sandy another. And after all, this concept of an oceanic micronation populated by ugly rich men and bimbo supermodels isn't a new one. Someone's already had a real crack at it in the mid-70s. All the way up here, blink and you'll miss them, north and south, Minerva Reefs, 500 kilometres south of Tonga and 700 from Fiji. Below the water for a good part of the day, they protrude a massive one metre at low tide. The northern Minerva Reef has a radius of about seven kilometres and the southern five. Its only real claim to fame historically was as a navigational hazard. The name Minerva, originating from one of her first victims, an Australian whaling vessel in the 1820s. It was here in August 1971, a chartered yacht laid anchor in the lagoon and a crew rowed ashore. Amongst the DIY they'd picked up in Fiji, metal, electronic light buoy, enforcing rods, a liberal amount of cement and of course chicken wire from which they constructed a crude beacon of sorts which protruded two metres off the coral and a pole in the middle on which they flew the new flag of the Republic of Maneuver. Satisfied with their work, the group sailed off to tell the world it had a new country, yet another one with a way better flag than New Zealand's. This libertarian micronation was the brainchild of 40-something-year-old American electrical contracting tycoon, Michael Oliver. His distaste of government intervention was well-founded in his youth. Oliver, being an adopted anglicised name, his home country was originally Lithuania, invaded by the Germans in World War II. As Jews, he and his family ended up in a series of Polish concentration camps. Michael would be the only survivor. After the war, he emigrated to the US, felt the United States wasn't living up to the badge of the land of the three, outlined how he would run the country if given a chance in a book, Come Manifesto, written in 1968, which sold well, and he resultantly became a libertarian poster boy. So when he floated his plan and sought finances to put his blueprint in motion, start a laissez-faire paradise, 2,000 supporters chipped in, Flush with cash, Oliver still faced a major hurdle. Where, Where was, was this new country, country to be established? Surely there's got to be some existing country willing to sell off a chunk of their territory for him and his mates. Well, no. Try as he might, trips to the likes of the Bahamas, of French Guiana, New Caledonia, Vanuatu, etc. Tangling the carrot of a bundle of loot for a small holding were all met with a no thanks with the respective governments he met. Conventional avenue now exhausted, he went to plan B. They would simply make their own country. Far enough from any neighbours who would care. The syndicate renamed themselves the Ocean Research Foundation. Two pinpricks in the Pacific Ocean picked. A flag now placed 
the sovereignty proclaimed. Ocean Research Foundation began a global public relations campaign out of their offices in New York and London, seeking global recognition and validate the Republic of Minerva. This never came. Partnering Oliver was the new country's unelected leader, Bud Davis. They wax lyrical about how the first part of their development was underway. Barges had left Australia to deposit sand. Engineering reports were being undertaken in New Zealand. The first 400 acres, with it the first settlers, would be established within 12 months. Another 2,000 acres would come in the future. Expected population when it was up and going, 30,000. Outside novelty value, no one appeared exactly overjoyed with this impromptu venture. There was a horrible thought amongst any country with a coastline. Acknowledgement would result in copycat states. At the top of those that didn't like this instant country business were the Maneuver's closest neighbours, Tonga and Fiji. To be clear here now, up to this point Minerva was nominally part of Tonga. However, Fiji had claims to the reefs as well. On a day-to-day -day basis though, unless there was a shipwreck, neither paid it the slightest, nor were the big boys in the region, Australia and New Zealand, keen for the Republic to get going. At a meeting of the South Pacific Forum in 1972, the members voted to grant Tonga sole possession. With the train now coming down the tracks in terms of a sovereignty dispute, Davis flew off to Tonga to try and string a concession together with their king, guarantee jobs for citizens building the infrastructure required, plus a few shekels to sweeten the pot. The king of Tonga wasn't having a bar of it, not even a moro. He refused to meet the delegation. Moreover, they were going to take back the reefs, a sent mark, by force if necessary. The kingdom had done their homework. They now knew international law it said ownership only applied to land masses above the sea at high tide, and they had, in that, two daily problems. Ones they were going to solve. The government pulled the passenger come cargo vessel Olivaha off its inter island service and press ganged 90 prisoners doing time, set sail south to Minerva to go one better than the Ocean Research Foundation reclamating the reefs. King in tow, which must have been a bit of a drag. Their first job was to dissemble the work of the meddling Americans, make use of the sand they'd kindly donated. Thus, on the 15th of June, 1972, the Kingdom of Tonga declared sovereignty over the two newly created artificial islands, rang their flag up the very same pole, whilst a four-piece brass band played the national anthem and the King away from the safety of his vessel whilst pondering what was on the lunch menu, or was it the evening buffet, then departed back to Tonga, one man short, he had been shanked to death by one of his fellow inmates. Didn't get to see the freshly minted Tongan stamp. Things weren't exactly going to plan for the group behind the libertarian utopia. Bad news followed bad news. Money was now getting pulled and the founding fathers divided into two camps. Davis, who wanted to continue to fight it out in the Pacific, in his capacity as president, he had written in indignation to the United Nations seeking their support to intervene in the dispute, labelling the Tongans as invaders. On the other side was Oliver, who saw Minerva as a dead dog. Another idea had sprung into his mind in order to pursue his utopian dream. He would back a dissident political groups who were seeking independence in their homelands. One idea I did like in his manifesto, by the way, was there was no tax on beer. When the militants were suddenly in charge, he'd share in the spoils. Two of those bets on a wrong horse, Oliver and one half of the Ocean Research, also called Phoenix Foundation, would back in the 70s and early 80s, were on the island come country club, Abaco, in the Bahamas. 
And closer to home, Jimmy Stevens and his rebel tribes people in Vanuatu. Meanwhile, Bud and his faction were doing a rousing rendition of Crowded House, minting coins to keep their funds rolling in, and trying to persuade shipping lines the Republic of Minerva was a credible flag of convenience. Bided their time and secretly plotted, and then a decade later, in 1982, out of the blue, they sailed again to Minerva to reclaim the reefs, by which time the Tongans, prompted after all the previous shenanigans, had purchased an armed navy patrol vessel from Britain, which appeared over the horizon, and to the dismay of what was left of the Phoenix Foundation backers, were unceremoniously instructed to piss off, whilst an intimidating Tongan pointed a large calibre machine gun in their broad direction. Before I say bye for now, and leaving you thinking, that's the end of arguments over what is little more than a navigational hazard and come staging post for yachties. Since that time, half a century ago, and driven by the fishing rights bestowed to the possessor of the manoeuvres, Fiji have re-evaluated their position, have now laid claim to the reefs, and talks were curtailed only because of COVID. They're still ongoing. My bet, after watching this, your ears will shortly perk up when this dispute over manoeuvres surrounding resources fully is up, which it will. This has been one hell of a story, fit for a Netflix series. I hope you enjoyed it. It was a hoot making it. Next one in my box of tricks, and the moving story of a Kiwi a soldier, and Ted Deverne's bottle of beer that remains unopened behind the counter of his local South Canterbury pub 80 years later. I'll never run out of great stories from here and around NZ, so I'll spot you next time. Bye for now.